So thank you. Now, now I have to try and pull everything we've heard this morning together and I'll try and bear in mind some of the questions that people have asked and as I go through my talk, if I can add in a little bit more information, uh, I'll, I'll do my best to do that. Um, the first comment I'd like to make is that each of the IMI projects we've heard about today are very large, really multiple partners, and they cost an amount of money that nobody would tackle on their own. And the real value here is to put in place platforms of information and knowledge that we can build on. So some of what I'll be able to talk about is what we're doing now um, and some of the things that we do in pharma to contribute um, to these big initiatives. So we are both contributors and benefactors um, of the work. And then I also want to try and give you a flavour of what the future might hold as a consequence of some of this work. And I'm going to take the liberty of being a little bit futuristic just to give you a sense of what might be possible um, that's coming out of IPS research. So what, what I'm going to do is talk about three different horizons, really. I'm going to talk about the present, how we use IPS, or IPS cells as tools, and I'm really going to just talk about some of the work in my own organisation. And then I'm going to talk a bit about precision medicine, and we heard some of that uh, from Ole at the beginning, understanding populations of patients and how IPS cells can help us decide which drugs are likely to be best in which populations of patients. And then looking even further to the future, um, individualised therapy. So not thinking about populations, but thinking about individual patients who might have very severe and intractable diseases and how IPS cells could help us find suitable therapies for them. And that's the furthest horizon. And there we can think uh, also not just about treating them with cells, but about using iPS cells as diagnostics on an individual basis. So I just need to give you a little bit of background um, on how we produce medicines if you're not from the pharma industry. So the first thing to say is it's a 10 to 15 year endeavour. From the moment we start uh, looking at the drug target that we might be interested in, we have to first of all identify... Oh, Sorry, back. Can we go back? Red button. Red button. Oh, too far. Yeah, so we first have to think about the drug target that we're going to work on, identify a small molecule that either blocks or activates that drug target, and then we have to understand the safety of that molecule, preferably in vitro, using the IPS lines that we heard about this morning, and then we need to run our clinical trials. And just to give you a sense of how much this costs, for any new drug to get from the idea to the launch, we're looking at something in the region of one and a half to two billion euros. And in order just to get into clinical trials, the early part of the work, we're probably looking at 30 to 50 million euros. And only 20% of the drugs that get into clinical trials make it all the way through. So there's a lot of failure, a lot of attrition in the way, and the more that we can do in vitro with human cell systems, the better off we'll be. So when we consider IPS cells, how are they going to contribute to this process? First of all, can they help us identify which drug targets, which enzymes or proteins or cell surface receptors, which are the most important drug targets, which are the most powerful ways of intervening in a disease? Can they help us tell us which molecule to develop? We need to know how those molecules are metabolized, whether they have off-target activities, whether they're safe. Can IPS cells help us there? Then uh, when it comes to safety, we can use IPS cells. And then in clinical trials, and I'll talk about one of the studies we've done recently, which, pa which patients will benefit most? What if we were to take IPS cells from patients in our study and see if we could recapitulate the effect of our drug in the lab, what would that tell us? So I'm going to talk about new drugs for pain because that's one of the areas that my group works on. And when we think about developing drugs for pain, the first thing you have to do is have a system in which you can examine your drugs. Now, the pain system in the human body is somewhat complicated and requires several different sensory or central neurons. 
The first one goes from the skin, the joint, wherever the pain is. Whoops. Here, up to the spinal cord, and then it synapses onto another neuron which goes up to the brain. Now, ideally, you would want to be able to take that cell and grow it in the lab and test your drugs on it. But it is, believe me, impossible to remove a cell that goes from your fingertips to your spinal cord and is the width of the fraction of a hair, and then to join it to another neuron of a similar complexity that goes to the brain. It's just not possible. And before we had iPS cells, what we used to do was to artificially make a cell in which we could test our drugs. And the most common cell used was a Chinese hamster ovary cell. And that cell was used because it's very easy for geneticists to put the drug target that they're interested in into it. And when I say the drug target, there are many different receptors, proteins, transporters on the terminals of neurons. And by blocking or activating these, we can affect the way that pain is transmitted. Um, and so what we used to do was take a Chinese hamster ovary cell and put each individual protein that we were interested in into a cell separately and then look at our molecules, um, large collections of molecules on those Chinese hamster ovary cells. Now, there's a lot of things that Chinese hamster ovary cells can't do that pain neurons can do. And the most important of those is carry the electrical signal from where the pain is up to the brain. And without knowing that, we really haven't been able to identify um, innovative new ways of affecting the transmission of pain signaling. Now we can, and some of the important players in pain signaling are so-called sodium channels. Um, and there's a whole family of these, and they're called NAVs. And you don't need to know what they individually do, but they're incredibly important in transmitting pain signaling. If you block all of those, you have a local anesthetic. If you block the transmission here, uh, you can certainly affect uh, things like um, neuropathic pain. So if anybody has experienced that horrible stabbing electrical pain that is pretty um, extremely painful, actually, but drugs such as uh, Lyrica, for example, work on that, and they work at the spinal cord. And then up in the brain, you can, uh, you can affect pain perception, and that's how drugs like opiates work. But in order to really understand how, how drugs might, new drugs might work in pain, we need to look at signal detection, how that signal is transduced up the sensory nerve to the spinal cord, how it goes across the spinal cord and then up to the brain. So a very complex system. And some of the important uh, molecules that I'll talk about will be, as I said, the sodium channels, uh, the P2X receptor, and some of the, um, the TRIPS. So how do we use iPS cells in target validation? First of all, we make sensory neurons, and I'll talk about that, uh, from iPS cells. And here, we've done work, and we are part of the STEM Bank collaboration. So we've been developing protocols to make sensory neurons, working very closely with other members of STEM Bank. We have contributed work that's done that has been done in our lab, and we have used techniques and elements that have been done in other people's labs as part of the consortium. Um, I'm going to show you some work to show that we've confirmed the phenotype. And this is quite a lot of work to know that they really do look like pain sensory neurons. We're in the process of converting that to higher throughput assays, and we've done some screening. And then um, we, we're also looking at the activity of molecules in iPS cells from different genetic populations in parallel with our clinical trials. So just to show you what some of the um, some of the cells look like. These are our iPS cells, and they express uh, peripherin and BERN3A, which are classic markers of sensory neurons. And you can see there's clusters of cell bodies with these long axons, which are characteristics, uh, characteristic of neurons. And these, in, in an adult, would go from the spinal cord all the way out to the finger or the skin or, or whatever uh, the sensory neuron um, is, is linking to. And then we've looked at... Um, what sort of drug targets, what sort of uh, uh, molecules are present on the neurons and try to characterize them and ask, do they look like a human cell uh, should look? So first of all, we've, here's just a characterization of a, a molecule called P2X3 where we can activate it with the appropriate drug and block it with the appropriate drug so we know it's there and we know it's functional. 
And most importantly, um, if you look at this slide here, you can see that these sensory neurons grown in the lab, actually, they have action potentials, which means they can transmit signals. And really, it's the first time we've ever been able to examine whether our drugs affect the transmission of pain signaling in the lab. And for us, this is a major step forward because when we're looking at, um, at the ion channels and the proteins that carry that electrical activity, we just really couldn't do it before. So this is a big step forward for us. And there are, um, there are drugs that we know block elements of that, uh, such as tetrodotoxin, which is a, a scorpion toxin, um, and the, another molecule here which blocks one of the sodium channels. And we can block that electrical activity and we can wash it out again. So this is a really robust and, and just exciting thing for us to be able to do. I don't know that I can say it uh, any more than that. So we've looked very carefully at what's expressed in sensory neurons, and we've tried to characterize the cells. And to give you a sense of how long this takes and how much work it is, we've been working with sensory neurons for about two years in my unit. And some of the, some of the proteins that are really important aren't expressed very early in differentiation. So we have to culture those cells. We have to look after them, um, really nurse them, and keep them very well fed, very stable, for up to four or five months before we can get really robust measures. Um, but it's worth it, because it allows us to test drugs that we couldn't test before. And it's not important to go through um, all of these, all of the targets, except to say that, um, for some of them, NAV 1.7, NAV 1.8, we're working on making selective molecules against those targets. And now we can really understand what elements of pain signaling they affect. Do they affect the threshold of the activity you need to put in before the signal is transmitted? Do they affect the frequency of transmitting signals? Are they also on other neurons, such as uh, motor neurons? So can we affect pain without affecting, you know, whether you can feel and whether you can move? All of these things are incredibly important. And after about two years of work, we now, this paper is just coming out this week on, on the really broad characterization of human sensory neurons. And the neurons that we have used are available for other people to use. Um, we don't get them any quicker than anybody else. The differentiation protocols we've worked out, but they're published now. They're available to everybody else. And I think one of the important aspects of IMI is that this is pre-competitive. And it, it's important to consider that when we work together with academics and, and biotech companies like Roslyn Cells, we do so in the knowledge that when we share what we've learned, we all benefit and, and it allows us all to speed up in our research and, and reduce costs as well. Um, now, I also mentioned that we want to be able to see whether signals are transmitted from one neuron to another. And if you use a Chinese hamster ovary cell or some other artificial cell system, you really have no sense of whether the cells can network, whether they can um, transmit signals from one cell to another. So as well as measuring the electrical activity of the cells, and they'll fire you know, on, at a rate of a few times a second, we can also look at how the cells are networked and how cells talk to each other. So they talk to each other, and they do so by changing the intracellular signaling of calcium. So you can see oscillations of calcium, which is um, indicative of a network of cells, communication between cells. And that happens not at a, a rate of multiple times a second, but multiple times a minute. So here in green, we've loaded the cells with a calcium-sensitive dye, and I think you can see that there are oscillations where the amount of dye, um, the signal from the dye goes up and goes down. You, you see waves here. And if you play the video, you'll be able to see, if you look at the cells here, how actually they turn on and off like Christmas tree lights as the calcium waves increase and decrease. And that's a property of networks that we can see with our sensory neurons and other cell types in a dish. So we can ask questions not just about the transmission of pain, but also effects on networks and interactions across neurons. Cool, isn't it? <laughs>
So moving on a little bit, I want to talk about some of the, the types of clinical trials that we are doing and will be doing in the future. So the first thing we, we should consider is how, how to stratify patients based on the disease. And I think Ole illustrated this perfectly this morning. If you think about Parkinson's disease or Alzheimer's disease, the symptoms that are manifest are, are those that you, know, that you can observe. They're, they are only just beginning to be based on what we can measure in a human cell in vitro. And when you look at a population of patients, the only way you could differentiate them into subpopulations is maybe through some observational thing they do differently, or post-mortem, whether they have different um, neuropathological consequences. You can't really stratify them based on what their, what their cell phenotype is. But now we have iPS cells, we're able to do that. And you might wonder why um, most of the examples that we've picked have been examples of neuronal diseases. And actually, it's, it's kind of obvious, really, when you think about pain, neuronal diseases, rare diseases, they're cells that you just can't get access to. You don't hear very much about iPS cell technology in hematology because it's easy enough to get blood samples. Similarly, with cancer, you can get cancer tissue and really examine the tissue that you get from a cancer patient. So in, in particularly in CNS disorders and in pain, being able to make those iPS cells is a, is a big step forward in understanding what appears to be one, um, one problem, how many, how many underpinning pathologies is it really? And then having, having done that, we can look at the, the phenotype of cells made from multiple different patients and classify them into groups. And then you can ask, of those groups, do they respond to drugs or do they not respond to drugs? So you can stratify based on the disease and then ask whether the drug works. And the benefit of that is huge, uh, not just obviously for the patient because you can then identify the drug that's most likely to work in the patient first, but also the cost of development goes down. The cost of clinical trials are incredibly expensive. A large clinical trial with maybe 500 patients is going to cost tens to hundreds of million euro. And so when you run a, a large clinical trial, you will have patients that respond really well and patients that don't respond well at all because you cannot decide what type of disease they have a priori. But if you know which patients to put into your trial, then you need fewer patients to run the trial and the cost of the trial and then the cost of the medicine can go down. So there's, there's obviously a, a massive value for patients, but there's also um, a potential value in terms of cost of development. So that's the first type of stratification. The second thing we've, become to, we've come to realise now that we have iPS cells is that uh, people don't all respond the same way to a drug, not because of their underlying disease, but because of the way the drug works. Um, and let me try and explain that in, in a little bit more detail in a couple of slides. So we know that there are patients that respond and patients that don't respond, and there can be many reasons for that. So first of all, it can be a metabolic reason. So some patients metabolize drugs very quickly, so the level of drug in their system never gets high enough to be effective. And we also know now we've got so much information from the Human Genome Project that there are minor variations in the genetic sequence of drug targets. And those minor variations can influence whether a drug works or not. So it would be really good to know whether the drug works at the drug target in the patient before you run the clinical trial. You're still all with me? I'm still with nods, great. So I'm going to talk now about some of the work that we've been doing. So we've been looking at genetic variation uh, which causes differential sensitivity to pain. Now, there are some very extreme pain phenotypes, and of those, probably the best known is the SCN9A gene, and that makes the uh, sodium channel NAD17. And you may remember from the earlier diagram, that's a very important ion channel, important in transmitting um, electrical signals, transmitting impulses along sensory neurons. And there are two incredibly interesting um, patient types. There are those patients that have, they make no SCN9A at all. And 
they have a complete insensitivity to pain. They can feel no pain whatsoever, but actually they, they can feel pressure, they can, they can operate fully functionally in this world, but they feel no pain. And they're characterized by a phenotype which might surprise you, which is this. And, and for some of those patients as young children, because they couldn't feel pain when they chewed their fingers, as children will, they essentially chewed the ends of their fingers. And also they are very prone to injury, to broken bones, to certainly getting um, eye damage because they're not aware of grit in their eyes and things like that. So while the patients, uh, subjects themselves, feel no pain, this is not something to be aspired to, we want to reduce pain, we want people to be aware of it, we want it to be controlled, but total absence of pain um, throughout life is not necessarily a good thing. It, it may be a very good thing for things like um, hospital procedures, setting bones. For short periods of time, total absence of pain is beneficial, but it's not something to be aspired to. Now, the other patient population that we've worked with quite a lot are people who have increased sensitivity to pain, where a small change in the ambient temperature, so it's quite warm in here at the moment, um, for those patients, this would be extremely unpleasant. And it would, uh, st it would stimulate a condition where they feel like they're burning. And it's sometimes called Burning Man Syndrome. Or, and and it's, it's extremely unpleasant to feel that you have burnt yourself, mostly an arms, legs, feet, hands, and characterized, as you would imagine, by this it, redness and, and pain. And actually, we've developed an AV1.7 selective blocker, and we've tried it in a few patients that have this condition. So those patients were incredibly generous, and um, most of them offered that we could make iPS cells um, from their blood as part of the study. And we are now in the process of characterizing those cells. As I've explained, it's taken us pretty much the best part of a year to make those cells, and now we're trying to understand the phenotype, but they don't all look like normal cells. But that allows us to ask whether the patients that you know, responded to the drug, do they respond in vitro, and to build that translation that we couldn't have done before. And an important point here is just one cell line isn't enough, and this is where EBISC, for example, comes in, because there are 30 different variations in the human NAV1.7 gene, and actually it would be useful to have most of those. And stem bank and EBISC between them are making a large number of those different variations. So we'll want to be able to look at, at what's the variation, what happens to those cells in vitro, which drugs work on them and which drugs don't. And actually, just across the, the human population more generally, not just the extreme phenotypes of people with congenital insensitivity to pain or, or hypersensitivity to pain, does, does our variant of NAV1.7 affect our pain response and does it affect whether drugs work for us? So we need multiple different cell types to be able to explore that more fully. And there are many other genes that we know are involved in pain. Um, and so we need to have many cell types to answer those questions. Do all patients respond in the same way? I think I've made my point. You understand why we need many and, and why EBISC and STEM bank are so important. Um, now, when, when I said that the other way of having um, heterogeneity is in whether the drug actually works at the drug target or not, and one of the things that we assumed when we used to work on Chinese hamster ovary cells, we took one sequence of the gene product that made, um, that made the drug target, and we put it into Chinese hamster ovary cells, one, one gene. And randomly, it, it was the, the gene that our geneticists had available. We had no concept of the variation across the human genome. But of course, now we know that it's much more variable than we thought it was. So I'm just illustrating an example of how you need multiple subtypes to know that the drug that you're making will work for people with all forms of the, of the drug target. So the drug target here is the P2X7 channel, and it's highly variant, and it comes in 29 forms. And this is some work, actually, that was done by some colleagues at GSK. This channel is actually very important. It, it's important in transducing pain signaling, but it's also highly abundant in the brain and important in other CNS indications. 
And one of the forms of the, of the channel, um, th this one, these are the two amino acids that, are, that vary, 3% of the population have this type of the P2X7 channel, and 13.8% 13 13, uh, have this type. Now, when we look at the affinity of this GSK molecule, this dose response curve shows you that it's 10 times more potent on this form of the receptor uh, and 10 times weaker on this form. And if you've got one of each alleles, one from your mother, one from your father, you're going to be somewhere in the middle. That translates to a significant difference in people because it means you're going to need 10 times more drug to affect this patient than you are to affect that patient. And pretty much until today, we never even considered that variation in, in the human genome could actually directly drive whether you respond to a drug or not. And now we have to be really careful because we pick that uh, cell type and that, that genetically defined target to do our screening. It has to be robust. We want it to work. But the next step is we have to be really confident that this isn't a very variable drug target and that there will be people who will respond and not respond to it. So this has added a layer of information for us, but it's also added a layer of complexity. So I come back to my point that in screening, um, we're going to need multiple genetically defined cell types to really make sure we're developing the best drugs that we can. When it comes to uh, using cells for safety testing, the two areas that are mo have been most important, and we've heard a lot about these today, so I'm not going to go into much detail, but they're human cardiomyocytes and human liver cells. And obviously the reason they're so important <coughs> is that there have been many drugs developed that have shown toxicity in the heart, and many types of toxicity that you can see in clinical trials is reversible. Patients can overcome it. If you stop taking the drug, generally you, you will recover. That, that's very much true of the liver because liver cells can regenerate. Unfortunately, it's much less true of the heart, which has less regenerative capacity. And if you have a molecule that affects heart rate, you can precipitate a heart attack. And you know, for that reason, many drugs have been withdrawn. We know now um, that we know now which types of channels are most important in controlling heart arrhythmias, and we know how to avoid them. But what we don't know is how the cells work together and how we can control cardiac contractility. And, and that's one area where uh, using iPS cells is going to be really important. So we have developed in the industry individual cell types that express only one channel at a time whose blockade would be detrimental to heart function. But now we have a way of testing them more holistically in cells expressing multiple different channels. And again, we're going to need cells from people of different genetic backgrounds where we know and understand the different genetic forms of the channels that they have there. Um, liver toxicity, again, we've heard about how, how that is very common with drugs. And you know, we have in the past used human liver and made hepatocytes from human liver as they do in Liverpool to test our drugs. Um, but there's not a constant supply of human liver to test. Even people who've been very generous in donating liver tissue that's been resected, it's, it's not easy, and the tissue is very variable for post-mortem reasons, and, and you know, it doesn't always arrive at a convenient time, rightly. So we need to have a constant supply of human liver from people with different um, forms of the cytochrome P450 enzymes that metabolize drugs. Uh, and that will allow us to optimize our molecules so that they're metabolized ac across populations fairly evenly, so that we don't have some patients who metabolize drugs very quickly and therefore need a higher dose, but at that same dose, other patients um, will metabolize the drug very slowly and have really, really high and potentially toxic levels. So that's why, that's why we need mostly cardiomyocytes and liver cells. And again, we need multiple cell types because patients' genetics influence how the drugs work. And, and actually, you did me a big uh, service earlier talking about the different variations. So some of the most common, uh, common ones we know about are, for example, polymorphisms in the drug metabolizing enzymes. So one of the enzymes responsible for metabolizing um, warfarin gives 
big variations in levels and anybody who's treated with warfarin, they need to have their drug levels monitored uh, so that their blood doesn't coagulate too much or not enough. And then again, the hypersensitivity to abacavir we heard about earlier, and now we screen for isoforms prior to admission. But these are all reactive steps that we've put in place once we've seen the toxicity in people. It shouldn't be necessary in the future to do that because we should be able to test ahead of time and know that there isn't human variation that will lead to those types of problems. Right, I'm going to move on a little bit and now think about the future. So one of the other projects that we work on is indeed cell therapy. And as well as using cells as tools in classical drug discovery, we are moving into the realm of using cells as treatments. And one of the treatments that we are developing is a treatment of retinal pigment epithelium cells to treat macular degeneration. And, and what the problem is here, uh, as you can see at the bottom, is that the cells behind the macula uh, essentially die, and those cells are not replaced during life, as we heard earlier. So in the normal eye, uh, the macula looks like this, and then the optic nerve is here, and you can begin to see in dry AMD uh, some breakdown of the structure here when the epithelial cells that support the <laughs> retinal neural net as they die away. And then in wet AMD, you get blood infiltrating and, and really um, you lose your central site, may, may keep some peripheral vision, but, but that is really at risk um, and over time will, will degenerate too. So what we're trying to do is really focus on this layer of cells here, the retinal pigment epithelium. And we've worked out, along with uh, collaborators at University College London and other members of some of these consortia, how to make retinal pigment epithelial cells from stem cells or iPS cells. And, and what we do is seed them onto a disc and then put them onto a matrix that we can put behind the eye in people with macular degeneration uh, to prevent them from losing their sight further. So this is essentially uh, what it looks like. So here's the polyester membrane. Um, here's the vitronectin coating, and here's our retinal pigment epithelial cells. And to give you a sense of how long this takes, to make the retinal pigment epithelial cells to treat a patient, it takes about a year from starting with the cell type, growing the cells up, expanding them, taking, through them, taking them through the differentiation process, plating them down, putting them down onto the membrane, and allowing them to mature so that they function just like uh, you know, really fully developed retinal pigment epithelial cells. And then when you look at the patches, um, this is sorry, just this is to show that we've looked at the markers, these two markers, PAC6 and PMEL, which are characteristic of RPE cells. So we know that they're RPE. The other thing that's very characteristic about them is that they're black. So they're pigmented. That's why they're called retinal pigmented epithelial cells. And when we have a really good preparation, you can see it looks like a, a carpet of black cells on a little disc. And we've also invented a device um, to put that behind the retina and replace the lost cells. And so there's 100,000 cells on one of these little discs. It's, a, it's, it's a two to six millimeters across. It's a tiny thing, and we just roll them up and put them in the back of the eye. We've done all our safety testing, and our cells are now being, being grown up, and we're on track to go into patients this year. Now, that's the first experiment. But after that, what would a better product look like? It might be that we need to put neural cells on top of the um, epithelial cells to get the best response, for which we're going to need to understand how to differentiate them, how to make retinal cells rather than sensory neurons or dopaminergic neurons. That's where the type of technologies that are being developed here would help us. We also might have a problem of rejection of those cells. We don't know yet. But if that's the case, then we're going to have to use different sourcing cells which are, which are matched immunologically to the patients so that they're not rejected. We can't swap out discs. It's such a fine technical procedure to put them in. We can really only do it maybe once or twice. So we're already thinking about what the next generation of product would need to be. And the work that's been put in place through these IMI initiatives is really giving us the technologies and the processes to help us improve on the work we've started on. But these are long-term studies. They're long-term projects. <coughs> 
Now I'm getting to the even more futuristic uh, for you, which is we've thought about populations and how to um, select populations of patients that could benefit. What about individual patients? Could we actually take one patient at a time and examine which could be the best drug for that patient? And, and the example I would use here is epilepsy. And this is something that we've just begun to start working on. So for patients who've got severe intractable epilepsy, some of them we understand a little bit about the genetics, but many of them we don't. And of course, the more epileptic events you have, um, the more severe your disease and the harder it is to recover back to your, your uh, pre-epileptic status. And so what we really want to do is, is take patients and understand which drug would work for them without them having to go through one drug and then try another one and then another one. And in many cases, patients that have severe intractable epilepsy don't have any drugs that work well for them. And, and it, it would be an impossible task to to just randomly pick anything you think might work. So in fact, what, what we've started to do now is to, um, is to work with uh, consultants who are expert epilepsy um, clinicians to take uh, blood cells from epileptic patients, make them into iPS cells, differentiate them into neurons, and then of course we have one unique patient cells in a dish. And at that point, we can screen for all existing drugs what already exists that might help these patients. Similarly, people who have things like severe cerebellar ataxias for which there, there are no really good drugs. We know how to control neuronal activity, but we can't go through testing every single drug on every person. But on an individual basis, we can connect the gene, gene information from the patient and what, what the cell does, and then really pick the drug of choice for that patient. Now, this isn't today's work, and it may be necessary to have a diagnostic company that really tries to understand uh, what genetic background best responds to what type of drug, and there's a huge amount of work to be done there. But we could not do this until we had iPS cells, and I think even when they were first invented, I'm not sure that, that we really saw everything that could be done, and it's only when you start doing experiments in your lab with your own hands and trying to, trying to think about how to do something helpful for patients. You can go from drug screening to populations of patients to individual patients uh, in the future. So my last example is a very recent one and actually quite a sad one. Uh, and, and this is not neuroscience but actually oncology. And one of the most exciting approaches to developing drugs for cancer is to take patients' T-cells and engineer them. And if you take uh, T-cells, engineer them with a marker that's present on the cancer and inject them back into a patient, then they can attack the cancer and really you use the patient's own cells modified to treat their cancer. Now, in a very recent study, what happened was um, the T cells were engineered with something that really looked like it was expressed on the surface of the cancer. The cells were injected back into the patient, but both patients sadly died of um, heart failure a few days later. And it transpired that there was a protein on the surface of the heart cell that cross reacted with the, the protein on the surface of the cancer cell. And the T cells actually attacked the heart uh, as well as the cancer. But with the use of iPS cells, it would be certainly conceivable and practical to um, make a whole panel of cell types and check that the engineered T cell didn't cross-react with any of that person's cells. Now, that's a very futuristic thing to think about, and there are um, scale, scales and technologies and things that we need to put in place. So we really need to be able to automate how to make different cell types. We'd need to automate how to check out a T cell cross-reactivity. But it doesn't mean it can't be done. This is now a technical problem, not a theoretical problem. And as we incrementally solve problems of scale and automation, we will be able to do amazing things in the future and treat diseases in ways that 
we could not have even thought of a few years ago. So with that, um, I'll just summarise here and say that the impact of IMI projects that use IPS cells for industry is amazing. The potential is amazing. This is a, this is a wholly worthwhile and valuable way of building the tools that will help us in the future. So it's a, it's a fantastic way of developing methods and tools to help us identify better drug targets, help us identify better molecules for treating patients, um, to better understand the technologies and ensure they're safe. It's going to help us underpin precision medicine so that patients get the best drug as soon as they can and not have to go through iterations of trying one drug after another. And in, in the further future, we'll underpin the invention of new diagnostics and personalised therapy. And with that, I'll end. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I believe now it's time for lunch. Is that correct? One or two questions. OK, go ahead. I am Natalie Kajanian from Science Europe. Thank you very much for your beautiful talk. I have a question because we talked a lot about uh, limitation of the, uh, of the opportunity of uh, IPS cells and as well as some challenges. We, we didn't, I think, touch upon the fact also some challenges that are related to reprogramming the cells and genomic instability and also epigenetic. I was wondering also if we are dealing with really complex diseases uh, that are multisystemic. Um, how uh, sure are you that the iPS cells that you are derived, maybe from hair follicles or other or skin, really um, are relevant for diseases like neurodegenerative diseases, where we know that the cells are not equivalent in, in different organs? And this asks the question of you know how good are these cells? as a model for, for diseases? So nothing's ever perfect, but we can wait for years to develop something that's perfect. And I think the question we have to always be asking ourselves is, is it good enough to help us make a decision? And it used to be that Chinese hamster ovary cells were good enough to make a decision because they were better than homogenized rat brain. And iPS cells allow us to make much better decisions than we could make with Chinese hamster ovary cells. But, but I think we have to keep in mind the variability. And what we're learning is it, it's information that we, that we hold as we, as we kind of move forward in our drug development process. So we already know that from the iPS cells that we use in the lab, there's a lot of variation amongst them. But then is the variation between people who respond normally less than the variation between people who have abnormal pain responses? So I think... In essence, it depends the question you're trying to ask. If you just want a robust screen that will help you to pull out the first thousand compounds that have any hope of blocking the channel, it doesn't need to be too sophisticated. If you're trying to decide which patients have got a similar um, neuropathological condition, then that's going to require an awful lot more work. So I, I would say nothing's perfect, but you just kind of step through and improve as you go along and share the information so that we can do that. Daniel Besser, German Stem Cell Network. I have a question which was not really covered in your um, talk, but I think it is important. So it, it is the reproducibility, but there's not only the natural differences, but there are also the differences between the labs and also when we're thinking about stab cells or Y cell cells where different researchers have different approaches and some might be more clear and some might be less clear and that goes also towards the question of reproducibility and confidence of the public in the research. So I think the Japanese highway program for regenerative medicine uses matching labs. So labs where certain technologies and certain findings have to be um, reproduced in another lab and they, they are really partner labs and matching. So do you think any along those lines in IMI should that be implemented 
So should we have a reference lab or maybe even have institutes which only are in place for reference so that we can be more reliable on what we're really bringing forwards towards the clinic? That I think also would be important for the drug companies, for the pharma companies, because quite a lot of inf effort is going into something which is really not that true. Uh, from yes. the beginning, so we should think ab ab about those lines. I think. So I, I agree. We are at the um, at the very beginning of our understanding of the variation and the sources of variation and the value of stem cells. And I, I think the answer is rather than rather than having an individual reference lab that checks everything out, that we work in partnership because when you've got several people involved in something, they tend to challenge each other ideas more. And so, for example. With our sensory neurons, we're working with the Sanger Center to look at 100 different um, cell lines made into sensory neurons and examine their variability and examine um, really the differences in their phenotypes. So I think for every cell type, we probably are going to need to do that. But rather than giving one group the responsibility of you know, validating everybody else, like, like most things in science, you end up um, re regressing to what is the solid ground, because it's what everybody can reproduce. And pharma companies are real sticklers for reproducing stuff that's been published and not always being able to do it, to be fair. But once you can reproduce it, then we use the same methods, hence the value of some of these programs. So I wouldn't personally be in favor of a reference lab, but I'm absolutely in favor of consorting with multiple partners because I think it drives for consensus and quality of data. Thank you. And at that, we have to end the discussion. Thank you. Thank you. So I just want to thank our two keynote speakers and our IMI project leaders. We just heard about the future of stem cells. This afternoon will be dedicated to the future of IMI. And just to let you know that this afternoon session will be moderated by Cathy Smith who is a former BBC correspondent here in Brussels. Enjoy your lunch.